and uh, I hope that uh, that you will find this talk uh, useful and interesting for uh, your research and general activities. Please let me know if uh, the slides are uh, stalled or paused or if there's any problem. Uh, okay, so the title of uh, the presentation. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. So the title is Understanding the Behavior of Commercial ACC Systems and Their Impact uh, on Traffic Flow. And this is something that uh, I have been working on for uh, the past uh, four or five years. Oh, somehow I do not hear uh, Mikhail. Can how oh, can you hear yeah, that? Yeah, I don't, I don't hear you either. Can you yeah, because somehow voice? yeah, couldn't hear you. No? no, still no. Couldn't hear you. Oh no! no? You said you're muted. Okay. Yes, probably I. Okay, now you hear me. Yeah, now it's good. Now it's good. Okay, sorry about this. Okay. Okay, you see the presentation now, no? Yes, yeah, it's very good now. Yeah. Okay, good. So I would like—I was telling that I would like to thank Viazio, who is uh, uh, the project leader. Actually, five years ago, Viazio awarded an exploratory project, and it was that time that I got uh, hired uh, in his group. So we were working together with uh, Costas Matas in the GRC, and we produced uh, some results that I, I think uh, they are nice. And then uh, one year and a half ago, I joined uh, uh, the IVT group here in ETH, and I work for the Traffic Engineering Group uh, Director is Tassos Kuvelas. I would also like to thank Johannes, who, who we worked together the, the last uh, three, four months, and uh, Yinglong, who is a PhD candidate in the University of Birmingham. He's working also in the GRC, and we did some nice things together. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a slide, uh, uh, the slide that, uh, the generic slide that I wanted to start my, my presentation, my talk. It's about automation and connectivity, and uh, at least uh, five uh, years ago, uh, every presentation for automation and connectivity uh, started with some, something futuristic, something unreal, because uh, automation and con connectivity at that point was uh, seeming unreal. Um, to me, uh, automation and connectivity is an evolving process uh, with uh, the cooperation and uh, coexistence of several parts. So uh, a couple of days ago, I was seeing um, a Tesla with a drunk driver uh, sleeping on the steering wheel. And uh, in this video, the Tesla stopped in order to prevent the accident. Uh, for me, this is automation. I mean, it's not level five automation, but uh, uh, it is automation. So uh, when we are starting to, to talk about automation connectivity, we can uh, 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 fragment this in a, in a set of several uh, functionalities and then also see the interoperability between these functionalities. If the Tesla called the police, uh, then it would have also connectivity. Um, and I know that most of us perceive connectivity as uh, cooperation with the infrastructure or between the vehicles. Okay, so when uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, 
the first hype, let's say, with automated, automated vehicles started, we had, um, it was perceived as a panacea for uh, all the problems that uh, we have in uh, transport networks. Uh, AVs promise less congestion, travel times, pollution, less pollution, uh, less accidents, uh, more parking space and increased mobility for uh, all the different groups. Uh, however, uh, most of us in the traffic uh, community uh, knew that this is uh, not the entire truth. It can be uh, in, uh, in many decades from now, but uh, at the moment, uh, maybe the situation become, uh, worse, becomes worse with uh, autonomous vehicles. And recently, uh, many campaigns, many experimental campaigns started uh, to run with the advancements in the sensors and uh, the portability of the sensors and the easy for the installation and processing. You see here some examples. The Pnevma database with drones from EPFL, the UTD database from uh, ETH, the HiD definition, uh, the, the HiD database uh, in Germany and many others. And uh, some of them, like the one that uh, we run in the JRC, which is called OpenACC, uh, were more focused on, on specific functionalities of autonomous vehicles, uh, like adaptive cruise control. And I would like here, I hope that it will run, to show you a video from a campaign that we ran in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, you see, do you see the video, the image? Yes, we can see that. Okay, so here you can see, you see also my cursor, I guess. This is the first vehicle, the second, the third. This is a campaign with 10 vehicles. And you can observe this vehicle, which is a Tesla, uh, by the way. Uh, not that makes a lot of sense, but uh, to, to mention the brand, but just for information. And all the vehicles are on stable state. And at some point, the leading vehicle, this one, will uh, hit uh, the brake. And uh, please observe at this point of the platoon uh, what will happen. Okay, so it's it's clear that uh, uh, there are uh, there are safety concerns uh, for the platoon, and I mean it's it's a, um, this platoon was going with a steady speed of uh, 40 kilometers per hour. And there was a deceleration for 10 or 15 uh, kilometers per hour. Anyway, what I, I will uh, talk about uh, uh, now, and uh, I think that we are approaching the most interesting part, uh, is a, uh, about empirical results um, and different dimensions with regard to the behavior of ACC systems. So you can see here uh, uh, six data sets. Uh, this, this data set is from Jorge uh, from 2014 with human drivers, uh, data set with, from Vincenzo 2005 um, from Naples with a platoon of four vehicles, I think. Uh, these two data sets are with human and ACC drivers from the open ACC data set. I will talk about this uh, in the next slide. And there is also another data set from the U.S. Department of Transportation with uh, um, ACC-enabled systems, uh, vehicles, and uh, CACC-enabled vehicles. And we will discuss all, all this together. Now, I would like first to do an introduction of the Open ACC. It was an effort that started uh, um, three uh, years, I think, uh, more or less ago. And we started, uh, we rented in the JRC premises in, uh, in Milan, near Milan. We have an urban network of uh, 30 plus kilometers. And uh, we rented at that point a very high level, high tech vehicle, a BMW with uh, adaptive cruise control equipped. And we were uh, running and car following inside JRC to see the behavior. And I, actually I was driving and I almost crashed it. Uh, because I, I had uh, faith on the ACC system and uh, it suddenly at some point the vehicle had decelerated and uh, I had to manually intervene in order to avoid the crash. So uh, based on this primitive, let's say, uh, evidence, 
we said, okay, let's start to organize uh, more systematically some campaigns. And we organized these two public uh, road campaigns. Cerasco and Vicolungo are two places um, uh, near uh, the JRC. So we had platoons of leased vehicles uh, going one after the other on public roads. And we recorded position and um, uh, speed. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, then uh, we did some more um, um, systematic uh, tests uh, with platoons in uh, the test track of Asta Zero in uh, Sweden and the test track of Zalazon in Hungary. Uh, and these four campaigns uh, are included in this uh, version in this paper. I have I used to put the references in uh, uh, in boxes here, so you can refer easily to the papers uh, with the corresponding information. And uh, so this first version of the OpenSC database has 27 models, 17 uh, brands. Uh, it has uh, measurements with differential GPS and uh, U-Blox devices, which are portable devices plugged on the vehicle with GPS and accelerometers. We have altitude information uh, for fuel consumption, um, uh, studies. We have uh, different powertrains, electric, hybrid, diesel, um, several campaigns, as I told you. And one of the most important things for me is that it's open access. So uh, the idea was to create a, a hub uh, where people can uh, load their data sets uh, there. So if you have something that is uh, um, uh, with or without ACC, uh, and it, uh, it's similar to those experiments, you can, uh, of course, contact Viaggio, and I'm sure that you will be more than happy to include this data set uh, in the OpenACC uh, database. Uh, and uh, after I left the JRC, Viaggio also populated this uh, uh, data set with two more campaigns. So there is now a campaign in Casale, another location nearby the, uh, the site of the JRC. And uh, another interesting campaign, which is not for car platooning, but it's uh, one of my favorites. Uh, so there is one vehicle rented in JRC colleagues for the period of one year in 20 JRC colleagues. So each of them could use the vehicle for its own purposes around the area or in his home country. So some people went to their homeland uh, with the vehicle. And uh, the only requirement was to record their position and speed. So we have uh, data from uh, 20 different drivers, which for me is quite um, interesting for any driver uh, characterization related study. Okay, um, and now the essence of this talk is to discuss based on experimental observations, seven dimensions uh, that we look into for uh, the commercial ACC systems. I'm sure that there are more and the reason of creating an open source uh, hub is also this, so that other researchers can download the data and work on things that we don't have the capacity uh, to work on. So I want to start, start with something uh, generic, an overview of the data. Uh, on the left uh, figure, I, I will try to put the pointer. Okay, I guess you see my pointer. On this uh, uh, column, you see uh, data with ACC-driven uh, vehicles. And on this figure, you see data with human-driven uh, vehicles. The first figure is a trajectory plot. Uh, then uh, it's the oblique uh, transformation of the same plot, just to, to visualize the, you know, the inter-vehicle behaviors. Uh, trends, okay, and uh, the third sub-figure is the speed profile, and then then the, the time headway. So we can easily observe that here on the stable uh, speed, the variation for the ACC vehicles is quite low. For the human drivers, it's quite high. A second uh, thing that we can easily observe is this amplification of the perturbation. So the red vehicle here decelerated with some uh, speed. And then we see that uh, this perturbation, uh, uh, the magnitude of this perturbation increases upstream uh, as we go on the platoon. For the drivers, it's a bit messy, but they manage to cope with any uh, perturbation uh, that uh, comes from the leading vehicle. 
Then, uh, on the third figure, we see the variance. So it's clear that uh, the ACC system have a, a time headway policy, uh, and it's quite uh, uh, it's, it's quite homogeneous, I would say. In in all of our experiments, the minimum time gap that we observed, time gap setting of the vehicles, corresponded to about 1.2 1.5 uh, seconds. So you see here that they are quite homogeneous, while uh, human drivers have the tendency to focus more on safety or uh, safety perception or, uh, I don't know, their cell phone or other factors rather than keeping a constant headway from the vehicle ahead. Uh, this is an under, another interesting thing uh, from this paper here uh, with a very wrong uh, label on the y-axis, but uh, excuse me for this. Um, so here you have the altitude profile of the road. And uh, here with the black line again, it's the rate uh, of uh, this altitude profile. And with the red line, we see the speed profile of the leading vehicle. So we can observe uh, an anti-correlation between the rate of the altitude profile and the vehicle of uh, the speed profile of the leading vehicle. And it makes sense when there is an uphill, uh, the, the, um, the forces uh, drag the vehicle back, so the, the ACC controller has to overshoot, and when there is downhill, we have the opposite uh, reaction. And here is the interesting part. You can see with the red uh, profile the leading vehicle, and you see how uh, the, the next vehicles in the platoon, the last one is the purple, amplify this oscillation. So, uh, I don't know if I forgot to mention this, but all the vehicles are driving with a steady speed, so there is no perturbation here. They are just driving uh, with a steady uh, speed. And based on the curvature of the road and the, and the change in the altitude, we can see these oscillations uh, arri arising from nowhere. And the last uh, interesting part, please concentrate here on the orange bars. And again, all the vehicles uh, here, 10 vehicles, uh, 10 following vehicles in the plateau, um, they have a desired speed. Uh, uh, actually, they go with a constant speed, and their desired speed is much higher, just to keep the ACC uh, system uh, alive. Uh, and we see that the root mean square error, which is the deviation, the error deviation of the first vehicle, the speed profile of the first vehicle, and its steady state, target speed, is um, very low. And while we go upstream on the platoon, this error increases, uh, amplifies uh, a lot. Let's go now to a more concrete uh, um, findings. Um, Christine, uh, last uh, week, uh, um, uh, was talking about the response time and was mentioning also uh, this method um, that I briefly explained here. Um, and we have done uh, several, uh, we have several uh, results with regard to the response time on empirical observations. The method is quite simple. Uh, you have, is, is based on, on the logic of the correlation of two signals. The two signals are the delta V, which is the speed difference between the leader and the follower, and the acceleration of the follower. And the logic um, can verbally be described very easily. So you have these vehicles here uh, traveling with a constant speed. And of course, when they travel with a constant speed, uh, their delta V is uh, zero, and the acceleration of the follower is zero. Now, at some point, there is an action, so a stimulus, from the vehicle ahead. This vehicle can accelerate or decelerate. Let's say that it accelerates. When it accelerates, it changes, uh, it diverges from the equilibrium point, so it uh, increases the delta V. And, of course, uh, this uh, vehicle perceives a different headway than uh, the previous one. So it reacts to this, and reacts with an acceleration in order to close the, the gap. Now, the delay between the action of the leader and the acceleration of the follower is uh, perceived as observable response time. 
I would like to mention that uh, I always try to not forget and use the term observable response time because it's not the response time of the controller. So uh, the response time of the controller can be instantaneous. What we do is to take measurements from the vehicles and observe uh, the vehicle uh, uh, system as a whole, as a black box. And we see the reaction of this system, which includes the interoperability of different components. So here in these figures, on the top figure, you can see the two signals with light gray, the speed uh, uh, difference, and with dark, uh, with black, the acceleration of the follower. And by correlating these two and finding uh, this uh, maximum here, uh, we detect the observable response time. You can find more information on the paper. I don't want to, I have many things to say, so I, I will go uh, on the fast forward a bit. Here we see the response times for the 10 vehicles in the Zalazon campaign. Please note that this is not the order of the platoon. It's a notation for the vehicles. So I cannot uh, discuss here about the order. My intuition and my um, idea from the data processing is that the order does not play um, a big role. Um, but um, um, it's, I, I don't have something concrete to show you here. So here we see the different speeds, the 30 from 30 to 60, and we see that more or less the response time in all the vehicles, in all the cases, it's about one and one and two seconds, more or less. And now let's put the connectivity into play. So here we have uh, the Astra Zero campaign with ACC, Zalazon with ACC, small, medium and large headway, and the CACC uh, data set from Karma, from the Department of Transportation of the US. And we implemented the response time with three methodologies. The one that I discussed before, the methodology of uh, Christine that was presented last uh, week, and uh, the methodology of uh, Lee et al., uh, which is from a paper of, uh, of Danzu and uh, Jorge, um, and uses wavelet transform uh, in order to, to detect the response time. And the three methodologies give different results. It's fine because an observable response time is, is not something objective, to my opinion. It's something subjective uh, and we cannot decompose it easily. Um, but the trend is the same. And the trend shows that with connectivity, we have much higher, much lower uh, response, uh, estimated response times for the vehicles. Let's go uh, quickly to the next dimension, which is the time headway. And the time headway is the time that the following vehicle needs to um, uh, reach the position of the uh, preceding vehicle. Now, if we don't take into account the vehicle length, we have the time gap. And how we estimate the time, uh, the time headway and gap. Uh, we take the position of the leading vehicle minus the position of the following divided by the speed of the following vehicle. It's a common, uh, it's an easy equation. And we filter the whole profile um, based on a window, TC window, to, 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 to discard the perturbations. So we see if within a window the, the time gap is more or less constant. And if it is, we assume that we have more or less stable state. Um, and we consider that this is a valid measurement for the time gap. And then we take the median value, and the median value from all the measurements that we have uh, corresponds to the estimated uh, time gap or time headway with the vehicle length. Of course, we assume that uh, during this profile, um, the, the vehicle, the following vehicle uses only one setting. And uh, here are some distributions. You can see on the left side the ACC vehicles and on the right side the human drivers. The, the distribution of the human drivers is as expected more uniform, while for the ACC drivers you can see easily the peaks. About the times, the actual times of the uh, its setting, we observed, as I told you, that the minimum setting for uh, almost all the vehicles, if not all, um, it's 1.1, 1.2 seconds, and the maximum for the majority of the vehicles is 2.5 seconds. While for some vehicle, for one vehicle, we observe that it's 3.5. I, I, I guess that it has to do with uh, 
the luxury of the product. Um, okay, and here we see the speed and the time cap for the different settings. So you see here small, large, and medium. And you can observe that for the different uh, speeds, more or less the time cap uh, is uh, the small setting. The time cap of the small setting is constant between one and two. For the large setting is between 2.5 and more. Uh, we discussed also this. Uh, actually, Christine discussed this uh, last uh, week. Uh, we don't know the behavior of the uh, of the ACC controller in low speeds, but we can observe here that um, these blue dots here are a bit shifted on the right. So, um, without having to show you a figure for this, but we we have observed that uh, for low speeds, since the time gap notation notion loses its sense uh, because the speed is very low, so it tends to infinity. Uh, I guess that there is the uh, maybe a piecewise uh, um, function of the controller, and uh, we have observed that the time gap the, for the, for the setting is increasing linearly as we approach zero speed. So from some speed and uh, down, it, the time gap increases uh, linearly. Okay, this is very interesting. Let's put also the connectivity in place. And we see on the top uh, row the speed profile uh, for human, ACC, and CSC driven vehicles on stable state. No perturbation. You see the variation here. How the variation reduces, but we see some more oscillations here, the amplification uh, as we go upstream. And here, how uh, CSC is like keeping the best out of the two worlds. This is the headway, the same, which is the headway, by the way, much, much uh, lower than uh, the ACC headway, the headway of CSC. Now we see a perturbation, acceler acceleration perturbation, so going from a, a lower speed to a higher one. Again, we observe how more homogeneous is uh, the CSC profile on the speed and uh, the headway, and the same for the deceleration perturbation. Uh, and now this is the uh, estimated headways. For the different data sets, here we, we see the two data sets with human drivers from Napoli uh, and Atlanta. And here we see the open ACC data sets. And here is the Karma. Uh, now, the CACC experiments of Karma 1, there are two data sets actually, um, were a bit problematic. That's why you see this uh, outlier. Uh, so they repeated the experiment two years uh, later with Karma 2. Uh, so I would consider this as the more valid results for CACC. And of course, we, as expected, we see that uh, CACC keeps the best out of the two uh, worlds. So going to the string stability to make things more challenging. So string stability is relevant to the introduction and amplification of stop and go waves in congested traffic. So in order to see to, to study the string stability in the literature, we see the deviation, deviation from the equilibrium conditions measured either on the speed or on the spacing. And we study this, one way to study this, there are many ways, um, is uh, with P norms. And more specifically with L2 and L infinite norms. Now L2 norm, for each measurement that we have, studies the deviation from the equilibrium of the observed profile, and uh, it takes into account its uh, observation. So it's, a, it's an energy-related uh, uh, metric. Now, infinite, L infinite, focuses on the maximum, for a specific uh, profile, on the maximum uh, deviation from the equilibrium. Um, and it's more related to safety and stop and go waves. And it's the one that uh, we will uh, focus in this talk. So it's this one, the L infinite. And then uh, in order to study the stability, we have two types of stability, the strict stability and the weak stability. Now, uh, the strict stability is, uh, is um, when we look at a pair of uh, vehicles where you have a follower and a leader. And um, 
um, you, you focus on, on two sequential vehicles. Now, the weak stability is when you focus on the first and the last vehicle on the platoon. So, in, in the end, you don't care a lot about the dynamics inside the platoon. Uh, but you see what gets in and what uh, comes out. And uh, in order to study the stability, we take the ratio of the infinite norms of the vehicle uh, upstream to the vehicle downstream. Now, if this ratio is less than one, it means that the perturbation of uh, the vehicle upstream is smaller than the perturbation of the vehicle downstream. So you have a, 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 you don't have an amplification of the magnitude of the perturbation. So you consider weak strict stability. Otherwise, if this ratio is uh, greater than one, uh, you have instability. And at this point, I would like uh, it makes sense to to discuss a bit the Zala zone and the two tracks that we used. This is a circular track. It's a, it's a circle with a radius of around 300 meters. And this is the speed profile of the leading vehicle. You see, it goes with a steady speed, and then it does a perturbation, steady speed, another perturbation, etc. This is the handling uh, course, which is uh, more real road conditions. The first vehicle goes with steady speed, and the other vehicles uh, follow. So, for the first case, for the circular track, we can see here the weak string stability between the third and the second, the fourth and the second, the fifth and the second, and we see this ratio growing as we go upstream. So, for the short time gap, I'm sorry. So, for the short time gap, we see the amplification of this uh, disturbance. For the long time time gap, we can see we can say that we have a weak string stability, and here are the figures. So this this plot here tells us actually that maybe there is a golden point where we can have a good for the capacity of the network headway and also avoid instability. But now going on the handling course where there is a real condition and all the vehicles go with the same speed uh, theoretically, you see that for all the time gaps, there is instability. And this is interesting because this instability observed here is triggered by um, probably the geometry of the road, uh, meaning uh, curvature and uh, change in the altitude. Uh, putting into the play the uh, connectivity, you can observe the CACC results here with the black lines. Just to explain a bit the figures first, because I think it's not very, pretty straightforward. These rectangle figures, on the y-axis, we have the magnitude of the perturbation. So how deep the first vehicle decelerates. On the x-axis, we have the speed, the stable, uh, the steady state speed of the plateau. So we have, of course, many perturbations, we isolated many perturbations of different speeds, and different magnitudes. Um, and the black points here actually are the more the most challenging as we, we are uh, imposing a perturbation on very high uh, speed. Uh, anyway, just not to to spend more time on this, you can see here on the on the green uh, lines uh, the perturbation ratio of the leader with himself, so it's always zero and how this ratio amplifies or uh, reduces while we go upstream on the platoon, first follower, second follower, etc. And, of course, if it's under zero, it's unstable. If it's over zero, it is stable. And we can observe here that Zalazo with small headway is uh, unstable, while with medium it's more or less stable, and large also stable, and uh, the CSC is also stable. Now let's go to the next uh, property, uh, which is the dimension, which is the hysteresis. So it's a common assumption that the, the reason behind the hysteresis is the asymmetry between the acceleration and the deceleration. Here we used a method of uh, Jorge to, from 2011, in order to um, 
provide some uh, results, and then the generalized uh, versions of uh, generalized definitions of eddy for the density, flow, and speed. So, uh, according to, to these uh, uh, works here, uh, we define an area, this A area, which is a parallelogram in time and space, and we uh, compute the generalized def edge definitions within this area. Uh, with blue is the deceleration part, with uh, red is the acceleration part, and here, for example, we see the flow over the speed. So, we see this asymmetry that we were discussing before, that there is a difference in the production in the flow while decelerating the vehicle and while accelerating the, the platoon. Sorry, not the platoon. Okay, and some results. Now, these are the, uh, the results with regard to time gap. So, you see here three time gaps, short, medium, and uh, long. And for the short time gap, we can see that while, deceler uh, while the platoon is decelerating, uh, this is the median speed of the platoon, I think, the flow is much higher than while this uh, platoon accelerates. For the medium and short and long time gaps, the results are uh, more or less the same. The, the flow is more or less the same. Now, let's see the hysteresis with regard to perturbation. For small perturbation, the green uh, uh, points here, the green lines, we don't see uh, uh, hysteresis, but as we increase the perturbation for 20 kilometers per hour, we can see uh, a hysteresis of significant magnitude. Now, uh, this is the plot of hysteresis magnitude uh, over the perturbation magnitude. And uh, we can see again that for the short uh, time gap, the hysteresis phenomenon is more apparent. Let's go to uh, the next dimension. Uh, I have two more, uh, this and another one. So, energy consumption. Now, when you have experiments with different vehicles, different powertrains, uh, different specifications in terms of um, efficiency of the engine, um, we use usually uh, this uh, indicator, which is the tractive energy on the wheels. So it's, it's the energy that the vehicle needs to go to, to move with this uh, speed and acceleration. And it lives outside the efficiency of the engine. So it's not a fuel consumption, it's a, an, an energy demand on the wheel. And it's pretty simple to compute it. It has some constants, these, two, these three factors, which are the road load coefficients. It's the, the resistances on the road, inertia, air drag, uh, etc. It's fixed values. Um, the mass of the vehicle, which is a fixed value. And then we have the speed and the acceleration. And by integrating over a trajectory, we have the total energy consumption. It's pretty simple. We have here six scenarios. And you can see in each scenario, you have this number, which is the steady state speed, and this number, which is the perturbation. So this vehicle, in this scenario, the leading vehicle from 30 kilometers per hour it dropped to 20 kilometers per hour. Now, um, we can see again for the long, the medium, and uh, the short headway, uh, headway, yes, the evolution of the energy consumption as we go upstream on the plateau. And as we go upstream for the uh, short headway, the vehicles consume more energy. For the medium and short, the consumption is more or less independent of the position in the platoon. And if we put the connectivity into the play, uh, we see also some interesting results here. So we have human drivers, ACC drivers, human ACC, and uh, the karma with the CACC and the ACC. Please observe the dots. So the order of the vehicles here is first the blue, then the orange, then the green, the red, and the purple. And you can see that for ACC, the order of the dots uh, plays a role. So you have an increase in the consumption, which is uh, correlated with the order of the dots. For the human drivers uh, here, here, and the CACC here, the dots do not play any role. It's the same that we were discussing just one slide before, that we were saying that uh, the position of the platoon does not play a huge role. And the last final dimension, and with this I will conclude my, my talk. Um, uh, 
uh, it's about the human behavior. This is a public road experiment with five vehicles from Iskra to a place nearby which is called Vikolungo. These five vehicles here that you see are human driven. So while driving from Ispa to Vikolungo, human drivers were driving. On the way back, the three vehicles in the middle are with adaptive cruise control. Now, if you ask me why uh, are the three and not all five, then uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, we didn't have the vehicles. So it's not a matter of the design of the experiment rather than limitations uh, because we didn't have more uh, ACC equipped vehicles. So on the way back, uh, we see these ACC vehicles. Um, and what we did here was to create the contour heat maps, acceleration, over speed on the x-axis and then um, color map uh, according to the joint probability distribution. So without seeing the R scores, which are uh, revealing some things, we can see that uh, these are quite similar. So you have a, 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 the shape, let's say, of the distributions of the contour heat maps are uh, similar, while for ACC, it's, it's, they are not very similar. And if we see the R scores, we will see that the R values are greater um, um, between humans than between humans and ACC, ACC and humans, and ACC and ACC systems. It's, it's like, um, uh, like saying that the human drivers mimic uh, better the behavior of the vehicle ahead than um, when you have a system with one human driver and an ACC uh, uh, system. Okay, so we, we did a comprehensive analysis based on empirical observations. We discussed the results with uh, human drivers, ACC and CACC. Uh, and we looked at dimensions like response time, headway, string stability, hysteresis, etc. Uh, from the results, it's clear that connectivity plays a huge role and can bring significant benefits to networks, uh, to, to, to transport networks. But um, uh, for me, as I see, this is not the goal. I mean, it's like saying that uh, will a system perform better if you give more information? Of course, you give more information and you expect the system to perform better. It's, it's uh, by definition certain that CACC will always perform better than ACC. The problem is that by design, the ACC systems do not account for traffic-related uh, objective, objectives. So um, we assume that they are mostly designed for safety and comfort, and it will be uh, a huge uh, uh, benefit and uh, um, good if we manage to uh, integrate into the design of the ACC logic uh, traffic-related uh, properties. Uh, about the data, uh, I expect that in the next uh, decade we will have uh, uh, many, many data of different uh, um, aggregation levels and qualities. Um, the challenge now is what to do with this data, because uh, there is a tendency to use them in black boxes, um, and uh, to me, uh, as in most things, the, the truth is between. So, I mean, you can use complex um, non-analytical uh, ML structures, but also uh, you need uh, um, a, a topic-specific knowledge. And the, the challenge here is how we will integrate these data between each other, the sources. Um, we will uh, remove the noise. We can uh, help normalize them, synchronize them, etc. And the final uh, point that I would like to highlight is the necessity for collaboration and open source uh, research. So um, I, I really believe that it's the time to to, um, uh, to to start collaborating more and sharing knowledge. I know that uh, the the money parameter is always critical for, for these things. But uh, as a principle, um, I believe personally in, uh, in uh, knowledge sharing and research sharing and data sharing. And uh, with this, I would like to, to thank you for your time. Um, and I hope that uh, you found uh, this talk uh, useful. Thank you. All right, thank you.
uh, excellent presentation. We saw a lot of interesting results. And for the audience, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. Or you can type your question in the chat box and we will read it out for you. Can I have uh, one question? Yeah, maybe I can start first. <laughs> uh, Macaulay, I'm very interested to see the benefits uh, brought by the connectivity. And yes. In general, it brings a lot of improvement, especially on the response time. And um, can you elaborate more on how to conduct those CACC experiments and what uh, what the information, what the additional information given to the CACC vehicles compared to those traditional AC, commercial ACCs here? Um, for the design of the experiments, uh, I I didn't conduct any experiments with CACC. But uh, I, I think that there are many uh, ways to design such an experiment, depending on, on your goal. I mean, um, when we are saying cooperative adaptive cruise control, the first thing to, to think is the cooperation with the vehicle, vehicles ahead. So you can cooperate with one vehicle ahead or 10 vehicles ahead or one kilometer. Or then you can explore other ways of cooperation with infrastructure. So with V2I or, um, uh, or with a cluster of vehicles. So there is no um, uh, deterministic way to design such experiment. Um, but the most common one is to, to look two or three vehicles ahead, something that uh, the ACC cannot do, um, and uh, you know anticipate. You, you can anticipate this way any perturb perturbation downstream by having the information that it happens before you encounter this in your front leading field. Okay, so but for the algorithms, I mean for those commercial ACCs, they're basically black boxes. We don't know their algorithms. So in those CACC experiments, I'm curious, so are they using our uh, own designed algorithms? Yes. I have I have the the citation uh, in the presentation for the Karma dataset. Yes, I, I, I I'm not 100% sure, uh, but uh, I'm quite certain that they have designed their own logic uh, and they have implemented it. So it's not that it's a commercial uh, system. Uh, rather, they 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 did the design and uh, they applied this in a, in a platoon. Okay. You can find more information online about the, the Karma dataset. There, there are many specifications about it. It's a huge uh, uh, okay. activity. And my second question is related to, can you go back to the slide where the headway is compared? Uh, yes. yeah. At the beginning, I, I believe. It was observed that human-driven vehicles show more... Here? Uh, Flexible head time headways. No, I think it's they so go go back to the beginning. Uh, ACC vehicles they show a very stable or less uh, varied yeah. time headway. But human driven vehicles they seem to accept. Uh, you mean this yeah. slide twenty one? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and previously we also see the results that human driven vehicles they seem to be more string stable because they don't overshoot the speed of their leaders uh, too much. So do you think there is some connections between uh, the phenomenon that human driven are vehicles are more string stable and human drivers can accept more flexible head time headways? Do you think there is some uh, cause and effect between these two? Yes, I think there is a relation on this. Um, so the, the the variability in uh, in the in this headway means that the, as I as I as I perceive it means that the human drivers um, have an objective uh, one level up than just keeping a constant headway. So they can observe the traffic downstream and they can anticipate any change. So this variability here gives them the flexibility to to adapt their driving strategy by acceleration or deceleration in order to absorb any perturbation that happens downstream. 
Now with the ACC, this is not possible because they only observe the vehicle ahead. And, uh, um, and for the CACC, um, it's, it's similar to this. So CACC with the information, the additional information can anticipate the perturbations downstream, but on the plus side, it can uh, also have as an objective to keep a constant headway. That's why you see this reduced vari variation here. And the problem with the ACC and future uh, possibly first generation automated vehicles is that because of their, um, um, their by design property to see, to observe the vehicle ahead, uh, they cannot anticipate the perturbation and they, uh, uh, they react with some delay on the action of the vehicle ahead. And this delay, as we uh, go upstream on the platoon, amplifies the initial perturbation from the leader. I don't know if uh, I covered you or if you need more comments on this. Yeah, that, that answers my question. I, uh, but I want to comment on this. So I, I believe it is also possible uh, because from our own experience, we believe those speed overshootings are caused by extra uh, large or extra small gaps. So if those ACC vehicles or human driven vehicles, they are willing to accept some large or small gaps and do not overshoot to compensate for those gaps, that will definitely help the stream stability. Yes, but then you, you, you would have uh, the impact on the capacity, no? Yes, yes. yes. It's, it's a counterbalance. Yeah. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Hi, Michalis. If I could follow up on this idea. Yes. Um, excellent presentation, by the way. Thank you. So I thought in slide 32, you, I thought you said that CACC was unstable? No, maybe I... So you said below zero is unstable? I want to confirm. Yes, yes, I will show you. Here. Yeah. Below the zero be is stable. Oh, yeah. I, I, I said the opposite, eh? Probably. Yeah, well, maybe I understood the opposite. All right. So now, yeah, it makes sense then with the previous slide we were talking about. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with how. So it seems like CACC um, has so many benefits, right, that we don't talk about much. So um, I guess if we want more details on Karma, there's we can follow that link to see the details. But I wonder if, if you know more or less big picture what's the, the algorithm or the data that they're using. Uh, I, I don't recall it, uh, to be honest, uh, I don't recall no, the right. details, but yes. uh, I know that they have platoons of five vehicles, um, and uh, I think that they have uh, connectivity between all, all the five of them, so they exchange information, all the five of them. But um, I, I really don't want to say more because maybe I, I, I'm yes. saying incorrect things, so... Yes, I can I can uh, respond to you by mail or uh, I can I can search for it definitely. But at the moment, uh, yeah, the I guess the point is yeah we should definitely uh, see what they're doing because there's some good um, impacts for traffic, right? Yes. As, as well, but for the CACC, I think uh, the few experiments from uh, Threadova a few years ago they showed similar results. So uh, very small time headway, I think what they had was 0.6 seconds. And then it was also string stable. So I think for the few uh, CACC tests, the results have been quite consistent. So very small time gap and then string stable. But the, the problem is, in order to implement CACC, you need the cooperation, which relies on the roadside unit. And the manufacturer is not going to do that, so yeah. that there's a problem for that. Yes, but if if I may uh, add something on this, I mean there are different types of communication. So there is a handshake communication where I send mm. you information and you 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 say that you you got it, and there is the the broadcast communication. So V to I, let's say. So in the assumption that we have some. Uh, 
black boxes that uh, transmit information, broadcast information to the available uh, users, then you, it, it might be possible, to my opinion, to, to mitigate uh, these uh, negative phenomena like instabilities or uh, um, headways, uh, variation in headways and speed by just uh, broadcasting information, uh, similar to, to, to variable message science, for example. Well, it looks like this is a perfect topic for the next webinar. So we should invite <laughs> someone working on CACC to present and then introduce more details. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Mikhail, I have one question. So excellent presentation. I really love it. In fact, I think you should put that into five webinars. I think there is a lot of information. Um, yes. yes, just one quick question. Uh, do you think uh, GRC is planning to do any protein experiment with identical uh, car models? For example, five Tesla instead of five different car models. I think that, I think that uh, they don't plan to do uh, more tests uh, on this, but maybe then the most uh, correct person to ask is uh, Biagio. Um, and especially with identical models, because it means, uh, you know, JRC has the capacity to lease uh, different vehicles for also other purposes, not only traffic related, so for emissions and uh, um, uh, policy uh, related activities. Uh, so I guess that uh, the leasing of the same model multiple times is not uh, part of their uh, business. I see. Uh, well, the good news is that I think Biagio and uh, Vicenzo uh, Punzo, they will have a webinar, I think, a few weeks later. Yes. So I will save yes. the question for him. Yes, yes. Excellent. Yes, very good. Reminder to the audience to feel free to jump in anytime. If not, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> go um, <laughs> so, it, can you go back to the part where you said the order of the dots matter? Um, it's about the energy. Yeah. Yeah. Can you? I, I didn't quite get that. Can you explain that again? Yes. Um... Its, its color represents the, the a vehicle and uh, the median value of the vehicle. This is box plots, okay? So you have this vehicle here. It's the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And uh, as we saw in the previous figure here, as we go upstream on the platoon, the vehicles consume more energy for uh, the small headway, okay? Okay. This is the second, third, fourth, fifth. Yeah. And so you expect the order of the dots uh, to play the role of the position in the platoon. And indeed, mm -hmm. for the ACC, the first consumes less than the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. But for the human drivers, you see that the colors are mixed. Because um, like in this graph, uh, maybe the third consumes more than the uh, second, but the fourth less than the third, and there is no consistency correlation yeah. with the position. Oh, okay, I get it. So I guess it depends on the variance of the speed of each vehicle, right? Yes. So for well, my ACC guess, is my guess for this, uh, sorry to interrupt. My guess for this result, because I also had the same question, is that it happens that in the ASTA zero results, every ACC is unstable. Uh, in that setting. So it means that every ACC amplifies the disturbance. Wow. So that's why you see the increase yeah. there. Yes, if there is a correlation, I agree, with the instability. And yeah. uh, this is for the short headway. So for the for the long headway, you might not see this. So here, for example, you see the, uh, the red line corresponding to the long headway, because we don't have in the Zala zone, for the long headway, we don't have instability. So, mm. um, uh, the energy consumption uh, is more or less similar for all the vehicles in the plot. Uh, Mikhail, so in, in one of your comparison, you compare the uh, checking versus handling, and the results seem different. So, 
what's the key difference in the handling and the other? Yes. We yeah, here. Yeah. We are still searching about this, but the idea is that, uh, okay, here you have some, some perturbations, and here in this uh, part, you have a constant speed. And the only thing that you can assume that it plays a role is this curvature of the road and the change in the altitude. Now, the controller usually tries to, to counterbalance the force of, from the gravity. So when you have uphill section, it gives more power uh, to, to the vehicle. When you have downhill, it, uh, it breaks or it reserves some power. So um, this counterbalancing mechanism, uh, I was referring to the altitude, probably there is something similar for the curvature. Uh, Biagio is working on this, you can also ask him next time. But the idea is that these forces uh, create some perturbations. And these perturbations propagate upstream even if the whole platoon is stable. And uh, it's interesting that in this case, which is the handling, all the vehicles go on steady state, at least in theory. But you see um, an amplification of the perturbation. The interesting thing is that for the long time gap, you see here that the, the, this ratio, the instability ratio, is above one, so it's un unstable, but it's not amplifying as you go upstream on the plateau. Yeah, uh, but, still, but the fact that it's larger than one still surprised me. Yes, yes, also, also myself, but uh, these are the data. Yeah. yeah. So do you think the controller will identify uh, and do something to uh, with the altitude and also the curvature? I don't think that the, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a small talk this because I don't have data, but uh, personally I don't think that uh, it identifies, uh, it takes information about altitude or curvature, rather than it uh, responds to the different forces that it receives. So, um, uh, when you have curvature, you have, uh, or, or altitude, you have uh, additional forces on the vehicle uh, that prohibit the controller from maintaining the desired speed. And the controller's reaction on these forces uh, have the results that we see here. This, this is my guess. Well, very interesting. Uh, hi, can, Michal, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Costa. Hello. This is Costa. I can jump in because I'm, uh, I have uh, been working with Michal in the GRC and uh, I'm still in, in the GRC. So I guess I could jump in uh, instead of Viazio yes. uh, for now for some things. Uh, about this, it's uh, what we're looking into right now uh, from those data. Uh, actually, it would be better to have more data because uh, we can work only for the leader vehicle of each platoon. Uh, uh, we see that uh, in most of the cases uh, they cannot really predict the curvature or the slope and it looks like there is some kind of a PIT controller uh, that the, the vehicle is using to control the speed and return to the desired speed for the first vehicle in the platoon. For the second, the third and the rest of the vehicles, uh, it's a bit harder to differentiate between which uh, actions are the result of the slope and the curve and which actions are the result of the behavior of the preceding vehicle. This is why we're uh, working for the, uh, looking into the leading vehicle. So our data are a little bit fewer in this uh, uh, light. And this may be one of the reasons that we see, uh, uh, we see it being larger than one, because in the handling zone, the main uh, reason for the perturbation was uh, actually the road geometry. In the dynamic platform, we, we had the first vehicle performing the perturbation. But in the handling, we had only the road geometry. So if uh, you imagine that each vehicle in the handling zone had to react both to the road geometry and to the perturbation of the preceding vehicle. And for the previous uh, question, I'm not sure, but I think maybe we would do 
some experiments with identical vehicles when a level three vehicle would be available for experimentation. Maybe this is our plan, but before that, I don't think it's very possible. So, in the topic of uh, the grade, actually, I know Michal is you're a big fan of the impact of grade in, in car following, right? Remember, we're having some good interchanges. Uh, so, in the case of uh, ACC vehicles, at least we haven't found that they incorporate the information of the grade explicitly, as you mentioned. It's just reacting to the forces that change. So, I'm wondering if you see um, a big improvement if we were able to incorporate that information into the algorithms of these vehicles. Uh... Yes, theoretically, I see a big improvement, but uh, practically, I, I see this, this as an additional source of data. So, before right. creating a standardized procedure that handles different sources of data in a, you know, in a common way, uh, this may also add even complexity to the system. So, imagine yeah. that you are in one place and you have this information, and this information then interrupts in a tunnel or whatever, and you, you can create instabilities out of nowhere. So, uh, I would consider this within a, a standardized way of uh, processing, not only this information, but also other sources. But imagine, so the trend is, one of the trends is to have digital 3D maps of every road, right? Yes. So, in theory, you could have the great uh, without error, let's say. Yes. Even then you see that it could create... Uh, no, if you, if you have, if you can store the map in the vehicle, then uh, yes, it's, uh, it's mm. best you have available the information. Uh, there are sensors for uh, accurate position of the vehicle, so I don't see any problem. In yeah. fact, I see many gains on this. Yeah, I have the same, the same hunch that uh, a lot of the instability might be due to the incorrect uh, reaction to the grades uh, and the way they interact. Excellent. So, yeah, I see we've gone overboard in the time. We don't want to keep you all waiting. Um, let's see the chat, maybe not more questions. So, uh, how do you want to close the session? Say thanks to everyone. Thank you, again, um, Macaulay. It's really great presentation. We really enjoy it and also appreciate the time from the audience, especially those joining us in the late night. We hope you really enjoyed the talk and looking forward to seeing you next time. Our next webinar will be August 18, and please stay tuned. If you want to join the Google uh, group to receive the notifications, feel free to do so, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mikhail. Really love it. Thank you, Dante. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.